Welcome to Northwest Fencing Center's Fencing Series on YouTube. This is Coach Michael McTeague, and I'm going to be speaking with you today about some of the mental aspects of fencing. Fencing is special. We have a very interesting situation with fencing because it's a zero-sum game. We both go out onto the strip, and we fence, and one of us leaves having won, and one of us leaves having lost. This is not how most things in life work, but the skills we're going to learn today, you will find, are things that you are already doing in other parts of your life. We're going to speak specifically about three things. First thing we're going to talk about is ritual. How can something that is a mundane thing that I do be used to create uh, some power and agency? Second thing we'll talk about is an exercise that we call the control circle. And lastly, we'll be talking about how we feel about particular things. Let's talk about ritual. When we think of ritual, we think of religious ceremonies, graduations, things that have very planned and ceremonious uh, structures. Let's take a look at, at ritual because there are actually things that you do right now. If you're watching this video, you are either in the middle of COVID lockdown or you certainly remember what it was like. When suddenly you were at home, no longer at school, or maybe you're an adult and you were at work and now you're having to work at home. It's all very unsettling. Why is that? Other than the obvious reasons of the pressure of the outside source of all of this change, there was change. You were already using rituals in your daily life to help keep you centered and focused on the things you were doing. You are now missing, or were missing, your trip to Starbucks on the way to work in the morning. Going in and meeting people at the front desk. You are missing hanging out at the locker and seeing your friends in the morning, meeting certain people, maybe even at a certain table for lunch during the day. These are all small rituals, things that you do repeatedly that help keep you centered and focused in your daily life. So let's look at it from a point of view of fencing. How can I use something like this, something that I do all the time in my fencing, to help me focus on a competition situation. I'm going to share with you my pre-bout ritual for when I arrive at the strip in an important competition. I will walk to the strip I will have my water bottle and my spare blades in one hand, and I'll have my competition blade and my mask in the other hand, and I'll put my stuff down in between the strips where I'm supposed to, and then I will take my mask and my weapon and place them on the strip in front of me. I will then turn to the reel and hook up the back end to the reel, clipping it onto my jacket. And then I will turn my attention back to my weapon and mask. I will pick up my weapon, hook it up to my body cord, inspect it for tip screws, test it on my foot, pick up my mask, and walk to the center of the strip to have the referee check my weapon. It doesn't matter to me whether the referee checks my weapon first or the other fencers first. It doesn't matter to me whether the fencer on the other side hits my bell guard first or I hit his. We're going to talk about why later on, but that's an important part, so I want you to remember it. Once we've tested bells and we come back to our guard lines and salute uh, each other and the referee, we, I put on my mask. And at this point, I pump the grip on my blade like it was a blood pressure cuff. 
and I take three short, quick breaths. And I'm trying to bring my level of excitement up to match what I need in the bout. I come on guard, and when the referee sa asks, ready or evu pre, I always answer yes. And that's the last little piece that flips the switch that brings my mind into focus for the bout. You all know that that level of excitement or concentration that we have to have during a bout is much, much higher than the type of concentration we would have when we are sitting on a couch. But we also know that we can't really maintain that level of concentration and excitement for the entirety of a tournament. We're not going to be able to arrive at 8 o'clock in the morning, get ourselves all pumped up, and still be that same level of pumped up at 3.30, 4.30, 5.30, 6.30 in the, in the late afternoon, early evening. So we have to modulate when we're excited and when we're less excited or more relaxed. This is where the last part of my particular routine helps me do that. After the bout, win, lose, or draw, I go back to the end of the strip, unhook the back of my body cord, unclip from the jacket, and either handing off the reel to the next fencer or putting it back in the reel box, I let my hand out, and as I let my hand out, I let out a long exhale. I'm essentially letting the air out of the balloon and bringing my level of excitement back down to something that will use less energy. You can see how I'm using a ritual, both at the beginning and the end of a bout, to help me focus and to help control my level of excitement. This is something that we already illustrated. These are things that we do in small ways all the time, but we're doing them unconsciously. What we want to begin to do today is look at ways that we can do this in a conscious fashion. What makes for a good routine or ritual? And what are some poor choices that we might make in routine and ritual? When we are designing a ritual that helps us get centered, we want to have all of the things inside that ritual within our control. I don't want ha to have part of my ritual be that I have to fence a five touch bout before the competition with my friend Sammy. Because Sammy might not be able to come to this competition. Whether he is there or she is there or not is not something I have control over. We are looking for things we have control over to include in our ritual. Another example of a poor choice is thinking of this as superstition. Superstition is when I'll do great if I have my favorite pair of socks, or I'll do great if I get to test on his bell guard first. I told you to remember that part. Some fencers are really focused on whether they test bell guard first or second. Now, does it matter? Not really. Why does it matter to them? Because they've made it a part of their warm-up ritual. But they've made a huge error. They've given you a starring role in their ritual that you must test first and they must test second. So now, if you know that, or just inadvertently you're trying to test second as well, you start to mess with their routine. They will not find this helpful. And if you have given your opponent or the referee or some training partner or another person or thing that you can't control a starring role in your routine, you have left an opening for your routine or your ritual to be blown up in your face. 
So you'll notice if you go back to my routine and look at it again, and answer this question. Would it matter where the strip was located? I take all of my stuff to the strip and I put it down. I put my mask and my weapon down next to each other. I hook up at the back of my jacket. Does it matter whether that's a reel or an overhead reel system? No, it doesn't, does it? I hook up my weapon and I check it one more time to make sure I haven't missed anything. I walk up and I allow the referee to test my weapon in whatever order the referee decides to do it. The opponent first, me first, push the button first, check the shims first, do the weight first. None of that matters to me. The test is a unit. How the referee organizes it is his thing, not mine. I go on guard and salute, and I go through my pumping ritual to bring my level of excitement up. Again, does it matter where I am or who I'm fencing? No. Does it matter who the referee is? Of course not. At the end of the bout, that extension of my arm, the release of breath, does it matter whether I'm handing it to another fencer or putting it back into the reel? No, it doesn't matter at all. Every piece of that ritual that I have designed for myself all the pieces are things that I am in total control of. Where other people interface with my ritual does not change what I'm doing or what I'm thinking about. Now, you can straight up steal my ritual. And I will admit that certain little pieces of mine I have borrowed or learned from other fencers. But it's much better to do your own and think about the little things that you can control, the order that you want to do things, and then you do them that way in practice. That way, when you go to a competition, it's something that you have done, you have rehearsed, you have used it to help you focus in practice, and it will become more and more useful as time goes on and the more you use it. It becomes almost automatic. You can see in the ritual that I had, everything was based on things that I could control. That brings us to our second thing we're going to talk about, and that's an exercise that we call the control circle. Lots of things are happening to us all the time. Some of them we have some control over. Many, if not most of them, we have no control over. I'm going to ask you to accept a premise. That is that we have a limited amount of energy. We come to a fencing tournament and we have rested a certain amount, eaten a certain amount, we have a certain amount of fuel in our system, and that gives us a certain level of energy. We need to divide that energy up between our mental work and our physical work. So we want to be as efficient as possible so that we get towards the end of the competition with the energy to continue to be successful. How many times have you seen a fencer, friend of yours, or perhaps even had yourself in this situation where you come to the strip and the referee is somebody that you just can't stand? Or somebody's looking at the DE tables and they're looking at the fencer that they're going to fence next? 
or worse yet, they're looking at the DE table and they're looking at the fencer that they might fence in two or three rounds. Will you be fencing them in two or three rounds? Maybe, or maybe not. Is the referee going to be on strip with you, knocking your blade about and getting in your way? No, even the referees you don't like aspire to disappearing. They really only want to be there to keep things on an even keel and apply the rules. That's all they're there for. They don't want to be a part of the bout. When referees want to be a part of the bout, they put on their whites and they enter a competition and they're part of the bout. This means that if we're thinking about those things and we're worrying about those things, is that using some of that mental energy? Yes. Is it draining the tank so that we have less fuel for the other things we need to do? Obviously. So how are we going to get around these things? Because these things happen to us. This is where the control circle allows us to visualize the situation we're in so that we can better control it. Picture a circle. You have this thought coming into your mind. We're going to decide if that thought belongs in the circle or not. So let's take an example. I hate this referee. Do I have control over who the referee was assigned to the bout? No. So I let it go. My second favorite weapon needs a tip screw. Is this something I have control over? Yes, this is something I can fix. So I bring that into my control circle so that I can act on it. I take the things that I can take positive action on and I allow them to stay in my control circle and those are the things that I use this precious energy to take that positive action on. How does this relate back to the ritual that we talked about earlier? Well, I want things that I can have live happily in my control circle to be the things that I base my ritual on. We mentioned it earlier, how the other fencer is acting on the strip, who the referee is, what their order for testing a weapon is, are all irrelevant to the ritual that I shared with you. Now, we have a few problems when we're trying to do a control circle exercise. And I want you to remember this too, because we're gonna be revisiting this later on. Our culture does not help us with this task. We are constantly being given the impression we have control over things we have no control over, and things that have no control over us actually do. So how do we alert ourselves and make better choices about what's in our control circle? There are some simple, easy measurements that we can apply. One of my favorites is time. An hourglass is a lovely visual representation of our linear sense of time. And one of my favorite lines in literature has to do with an hourglass as it applies to one's life. The future flows into the past through the pinch of now. Thank you, Terry Pratchett. You are here. So if the thing you are thinking belongs in your control circle hasn't happened yet, 
like who you might fence two DEs from now, or happened in the past, what happened the last time I fenced this person, they are not something that are in our control. The things in time measurement that are in our control happen right here. Now, what else can I use as a simple, easy measurement? I call this one ownership. Is it something I own? And you can be as literal about this as you want. Do I have control over my weapons? Yup, I do. I may not have control over whether one breaks in about, but I have control over their preparation, their setup, where and when I carry them, how I hold them, how picky I am about how whether the blade is straight or has a certain curve to it. These are all things that I own. When I own them, they are things I control, they belong in my control circle, and as we saw earlier, can be excellent choices when we're designing our own pre-competition ritual. We've looked at our first example of ritual, and we've even talked about how small rituals that we've already been doing during the day are things we use all the time. And we've also talked about our control circle and how the rituals we design, whether they're pre-competition rituals or pre-homework rituals or pre-shopping rituals, if we have ownership of the things in the control circle and they're happening at the appropriate time, we can use those to help ourselves get through normal things in life, not just high-stress pre-competition situations. That leads us kind of naturally into the last piece here, how we feel about things, our attitude about the things that are happening around us. And I'm going to share a short story to illustrate. Picture the scenario, it's a long, long time ago. We're in the mountains and there are two Buddhist monks walking along, an old, old Buddhist monk and a fairly young one. They're headed towards the monastery, which is many, many miles away. During their travels, they come across a stream crossing that's rather difficult, and coming across the stream in the other direction is a princess and all her helpers and courtiers and whatnot, and they're having a very difficult time getting all of her things across and getting her across. Part of the reason they're having a difficult time is she's howling and hollering and yelling and criticizing and nagging people the whole nine yards about doing everything the right way, whatever that is. The older monk looks at this situation, walks across the stream, picks the princess up, carries her back across the stream, and places her on the other side. She is furious with him. You didn't do that. Well, you were disrespectful. You were rough. Yada, yada, yada. She's being a real pain in the you-know-what. The monk just bows, and the two of them continue on down the road. The younger monk is clearly agitated, and remains so for quite some time. In fact, it's several hours later when he finally just loses it completely. Why didn't you give her what for? How come you accepted that kind of treatment? Oh my goodness, how come, you know, and he just, you know, is going off on the older monk about how come he didn't do something about that situation and how awful she was and how terrible she was. And the old monk turns to the newer monk and says to him, I put the princess down hours ago. How come you are still carrying her? Hmm. A lot of the time, things happen to us, and we hang on to them. And we worry at them, like a dog chewing on a bone. Do we have to? Nope. We definitely don't. 
the way that younger monk felt about things influenced how he was reacting to it and how he was reacting to it fed back into how he felt about it and it resulted in the classic vicious circle where he just made himself more and more and more upset. A vicious circle is nothing like a control circle. A vicious circle is really more of a spiral going ever tighter and tighter and tighter. And you can see how that younger monk was wound up tighter and tighter and tighter until he was consumed totally with this particular thought. You can see how this monk energy was all consumed because he wasn't thinking about things that were under his control. This is, again, a situation where our culture is no help. You hear it all the time in language, commercials, movies. She made me so mad. He made me so happy. He makes things terrible. These really aren't the way things happen. Someone can come into a room and not be behaving in a particularly good way and we can decide to focus on it or we can decide to let it go. That is within our control. Fits in our circle. That's a thought we can let stay or a thought we can let go. We want to think about where we place the energy and the emphasis. Do I want to dwell on the princess as I'm walking through the mountains? Or would I rather look around me and see the scenery? Would I rather spend that free thought time that I have while walking, thinking about a project, something I was learning, something I was looking forward to? Or I could even go back in time and I could think about a memory that I was very happy with. And look at that. What make, why does it make me happy? What happened there that I contributed to that situation that made it a positive one? This applies in fencing at a competition. We've looked at the examples in the, controls, in the control circle exercise of worrying about, about I haven't fenced yet and may not fence or worrying about the bout I am fencing now. This is the way we want to try to approach things. But again, our culture and the way we typically use language doesn't help us a lot of the time. How many times have you heard someone say, or even heard yourself say, I always do that. Or, I never seem to be able to hit that target. Think about the power of the language we use, whether we're vocalizing out loud or sub-vocalizing in our head. Sports psychologists call that self-talk. It's simple. I can just acknowledge it in the way I speak about it. I'm having trouble hitting that target, but I'm working on improving it. Now, when I try to improve something, I can look inward for solutions, and I can also look outward for solutions. When I look inward, I look within my control circle at things that I can have a positive effect on, things I can take action on. When I look outward, I look for wisdom and information from any source that I can find. 
This is what coaches, teachers, parents, training partners, this is where these people in our lives can have a positive effect. And the way we approach asking for that help has an effect on that as well. And the language we use, not only when we describe the issue we're having, but when we ask for that help, has a great deal of influence on the outcome. Design your own ritual. Think about the way you're using language. Draw your own picture of a control circle and share it with us at social at nwfencing.org.